Please label these notes integrals for notes, the first fundamental theorem, and write today's date. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to use the first fundamental theorem of calculus to find the exact value of a definite integral. So the first fundamental theorem of calculus states the following. If capital F of x, so this is uppercase, is the antiderivative of f of x, this is the lowercase, then the following is true. The integral from a to b of f of x, this is lowercase, dx equals capital F of b minus capital F of a. So what this is really saying is it's the same as saying that the area under a curve, which is what we're really talking about over here, so it's the area under the lower case f of x from a to b is the change in its antiderivative capital F of x from a to b. And we've actually worked with this extensively already. It's, it's nothing particularly new. Because what we were saying is we were saying that if this is lowercase f of x, and that's a, that's b, we have some sort of shape here, and this area here is 2, that this area here is the same as the change in capital F from A to B. That basically if this area is 2, then this went up 2 from A to B. And this idea is so important because it's where two branches of calculus merge. We spent all this time finding the derivative, finding the derivative, finding the derivative, finding the slope of the tangent line. And then we spent all this time finding the area, using little Riemann sums to estimate the area overall. And now this fundamental theorem of calculus, and it's so important that it's called that fundamental theorem, uh, says that we can put those two things together. If we're looking for the area under the curve and we have an equation for lowercase f of x, if we can take the antiderivative using those techniques that we worked with earlier, if we can find that antiderivative, then we can just plug in these numbers and subtract them, and boom, there's our answer. We don't have to do Riemann sums anymore. And previously when we worked with this, we were using this fact that, like say this was the velocity curve, that if we found the area under the velocity curve, that would give us the change in position. We were trying to find something about the change in position graph. Now what we're doing though is we're going the other way. We're using our knowledge of essentially the equation for the position graph to figure out the exact area under the curve of the velocity graph. Um, you'll notice this capital F and this lowercase f. This is a fairly common convention that you'll see that a capital letter is used uh, for the antiderivative and the lowercase letter is used for the derivative. It's a little bit tough with my handwriting to tell which is which, so I'm going to try to be really, really careful with it. So what we're going to be seeing now are problems similar to ones we were doing with Riemann sums. So let's say find the antiderivative or the integral from 1 to 3 of x squared dx. 
except now instead of estimating it using Riemann sums, we're going to find the exact value. So um, I'm going to write out some steps for uh, how we're going to do these problems. These are the same always. First, we're going to take the antiderivative. Then we're going to write our bounds. So the bounds are the numbers right here. Then we're going to substitute the bounds. Substitute. Into the antiderivative. And subtract. We always do the upper minus the lower. Even if the upper one is actually smaller, we're still always going to do the upper one, whatever one's up here, minus whatever one's down here. And then the fourth thing we're going to do is check on the calculator. Uh, if it's available. And the way that we're going to check on the calculator is we go to math 9, it says finite integral. And then we're going to have an expression that's going to look like this. It's going to be finite integral. And we're going to do the original The original expression, variable, lower, bound, and upper bound. Notice here we're always going to do the upper bound minus the lower bound. In the finite integral, we're going from smallest to largest, from the lower bound to the upper bound. Uh, so let's look at how that comes out. So right here, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the antiderivative. So the antiderivative of x squared, we add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. And one of the things that's very confusing is that when we do this, we aren't going to write a plus c. When we're doing an indefinite integral or an antiderivative, normally we have that plus c. If we're doing it with the numbers in it, though, when we do our subtraction in the middle, where those plus c's are going to subtract out, so we actually don't have to put it in originally. If you do, it's not wrong, it's just extra. So this is the antiderivative. And then what we're going to do is we're going to write our bounds. There are two notations. One is that you'll just see these li this line with a 1 comma 3. You'll also sometimes see this as a little bracket like that with a 1 for the lower bound, 3 for the upper bound. In either case, this is going to be the upper bound. This is going to be the lower bound. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to substitute the bounds into the antiderivative and subtract. Make sure you have parentheses when you do this, especially if there's any addition or subtraction in the antiderivative. So we're going to substitute in 3 cubed over 3. Make sure your substitution's in parentheses. Subtract 1 cubed over 3. And all we have to do now is that uh, simplification. So 3 cubed is 27 over 3, minus 1 cubed is 1 over 3, giving us 26 thirds. Now what I'm going to do to check that, I get out my calculator, math, and then if I go all the way down here to 9, that's finite integral. So I'm going to put in my original equation. So I can check this just by having this, if I cover up all the other work that I've done. So first thing I'm going to put in is that expression, x squared, then my variable, which is x, you know, it makes it a little darker. Then I'm going to put in my lower bound first, 
than the upper bound. Close parentheses. All right, like that. Now if I turn that into a fraction, should end up exactly what I got before, which it does. So, good. We check that off. The remainder of this lecture is just showing you a bunch of different examples. It is really, really important for this to be able to take the antiderivative accurately. If you can't do that, you really, really have to go and brush up on it. So for our second problem, let's find the integral from negative 1 to 4 of x plus 5 dx. I want to show you this one because I want you to see how you need to work with addition really carefully when doing these problems. So the first thing that we're going to do in our steps is we're going to take the antiderivative. So that's x squared over 2 plus 5x. Again, this has to be very automatic. And we're going to put in our bounds from negative 1 to 4. This is why I like to use this notation with the brackets because it says this whole thing is our antiderivative. So then we substitute this into both of these. So whole thing, 4 squared over 2 plus 5 times 4. Then we're going to subtract this negative 1 substituted into the whole thing. Don't lose track of your negative right here. This simplifies to 28 minus negative 4.5, which gives us 32.5. Again, with our calculator, math 9, work with the original expression, Thirty-two point five. For ones like this, you really, 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 really have to be able to take the antiderivative accurately. Um, what I'm going to do with this is I'm first going to have to rewrite before taking my antiderivative. Remember, you need to keep your rewrite steps distinct from your other steps. So I'm actually just going to do the rewrite steps over here and then I'm going to do the antiderivative over here. So this is the same as the integral from 2 to 3, x to the negative 3 dx. When I take that antiderivative, I add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, write my bounds. Now, it's hard to evaluate numbers that have a negative exponent, so I'm going to rewrite this again. Notice I haven't done the substitution, so I still have all this. And now I'm going to put in my bounds, do that substitution. Simplify. So subtracting a negative gives us a positive. I can find common denominators. There we are. When I put this back in, There we are. And that's correct. 
you should also be able to evaluate when you have things like e or trigonometric functions. So if we're doing the integral from 0 to 2 of e to the x plus 4 dx, we're going to do our antiderivative of e to the x is just e to the x plus 4x. We're going from 0 to 2. When we substitute this in, we have e squared plus 4 times 2. All of that minus e to the 0, we're putting in that 0. So we have e squared plus 8 minus anything to the 0 power is 1. 4 times 0 is 0. Make sure you distribute that negative, although the 0 goes away. Check it. e to the x plus 4 comma x comma 0 comma 2. Now we can't do math fraction because it's not a math fraction because it's not a fraction over here. But I can do putting this in to see what decimal I get. So e squared plus 7. Same thing. It's exactly what we should get. Probably the hardest one are the trigonometric functions. Let's find the integral from 0 to pi of sine x dx. So remember, we're doing the antiderivative, so we're going to go this way. So this is negative cosine of x. Our bounds are 0 to pi. So we're going to do negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine of 0. You just got to know how to evaluate these puppies. So here, when x is pi, we've got the point negative 1, 0. When uh, x is 0, we have the point 1, comma 0. So cosine is the x value. That means the cosine of pi is negative 1. So we have a negative, negative 1, minus a negative cosine of 0 is just positive 1. So make sure you watch out for those negatives. Those two negatives get together to be a positive, get together to be a positive. 1 plus 1 is 2. When we check it here, need to make sure you're in radians first. This radians should be highlighted. Math 9, sine of x, comma, x, comma, 0, comma, pi. Remember your pi button is right above the caret. There we go. And our final one is just showing you how sometimes we have those rewrite steps uh, still in here. So let's do the integral from 1 to 2. x squared plus 1 over x dx. And let's keep our rewrite steps over here before we do our integral steps over here. So this is the same as saying this is the integral from 1 to 2. Uh, we can see that this exponent is bigger than this one, so we can split up this fraction. And if we simplify that, we have the integral from 1 to 2 of x plus 1 over x dx. If we take that antiderivative, we get x squared, add 1 to the exponent, divided by 2. Then you just have to remember the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of x. We're going from 1 to 2. So 2 squared over 2 plus the natural log of 2 minus 1 squared over 2 plus the natural log of 1. So 2 squared is 4 divided by 2 is 2. So 
as one half. Another thing you just kind of know, the natural log of one is zero. Um, you can do it on your calculator and confirm. But this is one of those facts that ends up coming up a lot on the AP test. Basically what we're saying here is that e to the what power equals one? Well, anything to the zero power gives us one. So the natural log of one is zero. So we have two plus natural log of two minus one half minus zero, 1.5 plus the natural log of two. The other way you should be able to use the first fundamental theorem of calculus is to reason from a table. Let's say for problem seven that values of f of x and f prime of x are given in the table below. So this is f prime of x, the derivative of f of x. If f prime of x is continuous on the interval what is the value of the integral from 1 to 4 f prime of x dx and here's our little table Here's f of x, negative 1, 3, 5, and 7, negative 8, negative 7, negative 6, negative 3 for f prime of x. So if we're looking at the integral from 1 to 4 of f prime of x dx, the really key thing to realize is that even though we don't have an equation for f prime, uh, prime of x, we can still know to some extent what the antiderivative is. We know that the antiderivative is f of x. And so we know that all we're going to need to do is whatever equation that is for the antiderivative, even if we don't know it, we're still just going to plug 4 in for x and then 1 in for x and subtract them. Now it turns out that over in this table it's giving us the value for f of x when x equals 4, that's 7, and the value when x equals 1, that's negative 1. So there we go. We could have used Riemann sums to try to calculate an approximation, but it wants the exact answer and we also happen to be able to do it much more easily with this than we would be able to with Riemann sums. Let's look at a similar problem right below. Values of f of x and g of x are given in the table below. If g of x is the antiderivative of f of x and f of x is continuous what is the value of the integral from 1 to 4 of 3 f of x plus 2 with respect to x. And here's the table.
negative 3, 9, 1, and negative 2. two, four, seven, and three. Go ahead and pause the video, see if you can figure that one out on your own, and then I'll show you how it works. Okay, the key thing to realize is that we can split this up just like we've done in the past. These are added together so we can write them separately, and this three is just along for the ride. We can write it outside. Now we're just doing what we were doing before, 3 antiderivative of f of x. We don't have an equation, but we do know we're told that g of x is the antiderivative of f of x. We can find the antiderivative of 2, it's just 2x. g of 4 minus g of 1. plus 2 times 4 minus 2 times 1. g of 4 was negative 2. g of 1 was negative 3. Two minus negative 3 is negative 2 plus 3, so that's 1. 8 minus 2 is 6, 3 plus 6 would be 9. That concludes these notes.